Good afternoon. In the second century uh, in the church, a Christian leader named Marcion suggested that we should get rid of the Old Testament. And he created his own version of the New Testament. He had one gospel and most of Paul's letters, but he removed all the quotes from the Old Testament. His idea was that the Old Testament God was an inferior being, kind of a tribal God of the Jews. Well, he, he was excommunicated for these beliefs, uh, but the early church was motivated because of it to start having it standardizing what the canon of the New Testament actually was. So they came out with uh, four Gospels and the, all the letters of Paul, and they included all the Old Testament quotes. Uh, ever since then, the Christian church has kept the Old Testament as part of the Bible. And they, uh, for churches that have assigned weekly readings, they always read something from the Old Testament as well as something from the New each week. So the Old Testament helps give us a context for, to, uh, you know, to understand who Jesus was and, and what he did for our salvation. Even so, uh, some Christians, uh, maybe I should say most Christians, have trouble with the Old Testament. It just seems so different than the new. All that history, and those wars, they don't seem to have much to do with Jesus or with Christian life today. Uh, those are, there are laws and regulations on one hand, uh, and on the other hand there's Jesus and Paul, who seem to be talking about something rather different. There's Judaism on one side and Christianity on the other. Now, some Christians place a lot more weight on the Old Testament than others do. Most of us know people who keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, who keep Jewish annual festivals, who keep dietary laws of the Old Testament. Uh, they have uh, misunderstood what the Old Testament is for us today. And we know other Christians on the other side who are more like Marcion. They, they never read the Old Testament, and they don't even want to know anything about it. They haven't understood it either. Now, some of these people are even anti-Jewish, and we saw a lot of that in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, some of that dislike of the Jews was unfortunately supported by the German church, uh, and, and it went hand in hand with a dislike for the Old Testament. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who dislikes the uh, Old Testament uh, dislikes Jews, but I'm saying that it does. Say, I am saying that it does lead some people in that direction that are, kind of can support it. And although we are a new covenant church based on the New Testament, we should not ignore the Old Testament. It, it does give us a background for understanding God and what God and Jesus are doing. There are admittedly some difficult aspects to the Old Testament. It, it's not easy reading. Uh, some of the stories aren't exactly appropriate for children. Uh, some of the teachings are hard to reconcile with the New Testament. And there may be people here, too, who have tended to avoid the Old Testament. So I, I was recently asked to write a series of articles about the Old Testament, specifically God's relationship with His people in the Old Testament. So today I want to share with you what I found uh, in the books of Moses. We'll look at a number of scriptures. Uh, some of them aren't really important in themselves, but what is important is the overall theme that we see here, and simply that there are a lot of scriptures about God's relationship with His people. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible tells us that God wants to live with us. From the Garden of Eden to the New Jerusalem, God's goal is that we'll live together in harmony with Him. Sometimes we overlook the theme, though, because we get distracted by all the historical details. Well, let's start in Genesis. Now, some of you will you know, remember Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Genesis 1, uh, say like verse 3. Genesis 1 describes the creation of the universe by a phenomenally powerful God who simply speaks things into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And he, let there be earth, and there was earth. He said, let it happen, and it did. Just 
by speaking. But in Genesis 2, we see a God who gets his hands dirty. He enters the creation. He forms a human being out of the dirt, like a potter might mold something out of clay. He plants trees in the garden. He talks with the human. And he fashions a little surgery uh, and bio, uh, bio, you know, genetic engineering maybe. Uh, he fashions a companion for the man. Now these stories of creation are so different that some scholars have suggested they were just kind of a couple legends thrown together even though they're fundamentally different. But I don't think that the person who put them together was quite as dumb as they think he was. Uh, the stories are here, both of them are here, because they reveal different aspects of the same God. Even though God has the power to create by command, He chose to be personally involved in the creation of humanity. He spoke to the man, He brought animals to him, he orchestrated events so that the man would take delight in the new companion that God had created for him. It's, it's this God who was stupendously, had tremendously divine powers, and a God who was like a human. A being who's both human and divine. That's the way God is revealing himself to be here from the very beginning. Now, Genesis 3 brings us to a kind of a tragic turn of events. But it also shows us something more about God's desire for humanity. Uh, Genesis 3, verse 8. After the first human sinned, uh, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. See, this all-powerful God had become like a human, making noise as he walked in the garden. He could appear instantly if he wanted to, but he chose to meet the man and the woman on their level, at their speed, walking to them, making noise as he walked, shuffling his feet or you know, moving the bushes aside or something. And this didn't seem to surprise the man and the woman, it was like this is the way God had met with them many times before, maybe for many days. They had no fear of God before this, but now they were afraid, and they hid. But God didn't hide from them. Although the man and the woman were shrinking away from the relationship, God didn't shrink away. He could have easily left in a huff. <laughs> Forget it. You know, abandoned the plans that he had made. But he had already known ahead of time that this was going to happen. He, he's the one who created the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He knew what was going to happen and what they would do with that tree. And there were no lightning flashes or bursts of divine anger. God asked the man and the woman what they'd done, and they answered. He told them the consequences that they would experience because of what they'd done. He still interacted with them on a personal level. He made clothes for them. And he took steps to ensure that they wouldn't live forever in this state of alienation and shame. It was a personal relationship that he had wanted with the people. Adam and Eve withdrew. But God knew ahead of time that that's what they were going to do. And he continued the plan that he was going to uh, have in mind all along. So God continued to interact with humanity. Uh, not only with good people, but also with bad people. Uh, as we re read on in Genesis, I'll skip some of the details because we'll just kind of skip through them to see the variety of situations that people got into. And some of you may be familiar with the stories, and others, maybe it'll pique your interest for reading the book of Genesis. Uh, Abel and Cain brought God offerings. Uh, one was good, one was bad. But God talked with both of them. God responded to both. He talked with Cain. He talked with Noah. 
later. He talked to Noah's sons. He talked with them. We don't know whether he was visible. It doesn't, have, doesn't necessarily say that. But he was talking with them. Now, God did appear to Abram, uh, which whom we know as Abraham. And he made promises to him. And God sometimes spoke to him in a vision. Sometimes he made promises to them. Sometimes he appeared as uh, like a man. Uh, Genesis 17. Uh, well, I have written down here verses 1 through 8. But that's a bit much to show up on screen. Uh, I'm looking for the verse that says, For God makes a promise to Abraham, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your descendants. So this covenant was the promise of an ongoing relationship to be their God. It wasn't quite clear what kind of relationship God was talking about with them then, but we'll see a bit more as, as we continue to read and see how God interacted with Abraham and his descendants. Uh, Abraham's maid, uh, Hagar, had some kind of encounter with, the, the text calls it in Genesis uh, well, 16, calls it the angel of the Lord. The angel spoke to her, and then in verse 13, tells us that the Lord had spoken to her. So it seems that the Lord had appeared in the form of an angel. And years later, that angel called to Hagar from heaven. Uh, again, talking with her from heaven as a divine representative, uh, God with interacting with his, uh, his people. In Genesis 18, verse 2, Abraham had some kind of encounter with three men. Three men came to his tent. He said, oh, you know, let's be hospitable and serve them a, a, a banquet here. In verse 13, we find out that one of the men turned out to be the Lord. And he had a face-to-face -face conversation with Abraham, and they bargained over the fate of uh, the city of Sodom. Uh, it's kind of a, God looks like a human being. Interacting with Abraham face to face and a personal relationship. And when Abraham was about to sacrifice his son, the angel of the Lord stopped him and said, You have not withheld from me, meaning God, your son, your only son. This angel of the Lord, again, not only represented God as an angel, but he was God. Now, these things are foreshadows of Jesus Christ, who was also God in the flesh, representing God and being God. God appeared to uh, Abimelech, the king of Gerar. How many of you know him? You know, he, he doesn't have a big role in this story, but God appeared to him, had an interaction with him, conversed with him in a dream. Abraham prayed to God, received answers. So did Abraham's servant. The Lord appeared to Abraham's son Isaac and Jacob in a dream. And they, he renewed the covenant with him. All these interactions with the patriarchs show God's desire to be with his people. Jacob wrestled with a man who, we find out later in the story, was God. Wrestling with God. And that's the name he was given, to wrestle with God. And God renewed that covenant again with him. And just kind of fast forwarding through the book of Genesis, we come to the story of Joseph. Now Joseph had his gift of interpretation of dreams. He knew that God would give him the understanding of what those dreams meant. We are not told how God did that. Whether God spoke to him, whether God appeared to him in a dream, I don't know. But Joseph knew what those dreams meant. And he knew that God was working in the events to turn even bad things into good. Joseph had tremendous faith in God in doing that. We find a summary of all this in Hebrews verse uh, chapter 1 and verse 1. 
it's kind of an appropriate summer, summary there. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors at many times and in various ways. There was a lot of diversity there in the way that God interacted with His people. And I think the same is true today. There's a diversity in the way that God interacts with us. My relationship with God is not going to be identical to the way that God is relating to you. But at least in Genesis, God was selective about the people He spoke with, and what He said, and how He revealed Himself, whether He appeared or whether He just spoke, whether it was in a dream or in a person uh, like, looking like a human being. Now these were individuals. As we come to the book of Exodus, then we see something as God is relating to a whole nation of people, a whole group of people uh, at a time. And they were, you know, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, and God called Moses to bring them out, uh, to bring plagues on the Egypt, to bring them through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai, to give them the Ten Commandments. We know the basic story, and you know, we've seen the movie. You know, but the movie omits <laughs> uh, some of the reasons for why God did it. Now, at the burning bush, God revealed to Moses a personal name, uh, which uh, Genesis, uh, sorry, Exodus three, verses thirteen and fourteen. Uh, Moses is, you know, all these different nations of the Middle East had their own gods. And, you know, your God shows himself to Moses, and Moses says, well, who are you? You know, what name am I supposed to use to describe who you are? Uh, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. In Hebrew, it's kind of pronounced something like Yahweh. It's a variation of the Hebrew word for is. Uh, so some people translate it as I, I am who I am or I will be who I will be. You know, I will, you know, it's my, I'm in control. Whatever I want to be, I will be. Uh, anyway, that was... Uh, often pronounced Yahweh. Uh, of course, the Jews are, tend not to pronounce that name because uh, they don't want to take it in vain. Anyway, at, the, at this burning bush, God was calling Moses to bring his people out of Israel to the land of Canaan, and he had promised that land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then in Egypt... God spoke to uh, Moses' brother Aaron. And in uh, Exodus 6, verse 7, he describes part of his plan, or part of his reason. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. That's a statement of personal relationship. And, and it's similar to the personal uh, covenants that were made in that uh, culture. Marriages were sealed with the words, you will be my wife and I'll be your husband. Uh, adoptions, which were normally done for inheritance purposes, were made with, you will be my son, I'll be your father. These covenants emphasized that it was a two-way relationship. There were two parties involved. Uh, much later, uh, some empire builders, uh, you know, adapted the formula to create statements of relationship. You will be my people, uh, and I'll be your ruler. Which kind of meant, you'll be my slaves. <laughs> uh, but that is not what God meant by this term. That's not the kind of relationship He was bringing, uh, bringing to the Israelites. Uh, Exodus 6, verses 6 through 8. God was promising benefits for the people. I will bring you out of the yoke of the Egyptians. I'm going to free you from that kind of slavery. And I will redeem you. I will bring you to the land that I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. I'll give it to you as a possession. He was treating them as adopted children. That he was going to give them an inheritance. They're not his slaves. They are his children. 
And since they, uh, he was to be their God, their God, he was. They were supposed to worship him. And that's uh, it's like seven different times in the account of Exodus. Whenever Moses tells Pharaoh, "Let my people go," it doesn't stop there. It says, "Let my people go, so that they may worship me." That was the goal. He wanted they to bring them out to the wilderness so they could worship him. Uh, in Exodus 4, verses, verse 22, God said, Israel is my firstborn son. Verse 23, let my son go, that they may worship me. This is the kind of covenant relationship that he wanted with his people. Not as slaves or as a conquered people, but as a kingdom uh, of royalty. The status of being part of the family. Having inheritance rights. At Mount Sinai, God developed that even more. He described the blessings that would come with His covenant. Uh, Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you'll be my treasured possession. What would God, who could create all the diamonds and rubies that he wanted. What would he treasure? He treasured his people. And although the, the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. By offering to make these people priests, God was offering the people to give them access to him. But it seems like the people were afraid, just like Adam and Eve were. After God spoke the Ten Commandments, the people told Moses, ah, uh, that's Exodus 20, verse 19. It says, you, know, you speak to us, we'll listen to you, but don't have God speak to us or, or we will die. They were afraid. They wanted Moses to be an intermediary for them. Many people would like an intermediary between them and God. Because God is scary. God says, I will provide for you a perfect intermediary, Jesus, who is also God. He's not a scary God. He's a friendly God who wants to talk with us, to have a relationship with us. But see, the, the people rejected him, and God wasn't put off by that. Uh, he continued to give the covenant to, through Moses to the people. He promised to send an angel uh, who had God's name in him. This angel who had God's name. It's like this being that's kind of like God and is God. And it's, it's, it's an interesting mixture of words there. It indicates that God is present but yet, somehow removed a little bit, but partly because of the fear of the people. Well, the people said that they would do everything God said, so they made this covenant, they agreed to obey Him. And we, as the story goes, we know that that didn't last very long. But Moses was on the mountain, talking with God, getting more instructions from God. The relationship was with Moses, uh, directly, and he was transmitting that to the people. There was still a desire for relationship. And in Exodus, there are several chapters about the tabernacle, all the dimensions, and you know, the, this kind of material here, and this kind of material there, and all the details. All these details, we need to see the purpose of the tabernacle in Exodus 25 and verse 8. He says, Make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. I will dwell among them. That is what God wanted all along. Starting from the Garden of Eden, through these promises to Abraham, to this calling of a people out of slavery in Egypt, and, and into eternity, God wants to live with His people. The tabernacle is a place for God to live with His people, to be accessible to them. Uh, Exodus 29, verse 42 
God told Moses there, I will meet you and speak to you in the tabernacle. And there I will meet with the Israelites. He will dwell with them, live with them, be their God. I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt. Verse 46. So that I might dwell among them. That's what he wanted to do. That's what he wants to do with us. To live with us. Now the Israelites kind of shrank back from that, from, from what God was offering. Uh, God knew that ahead of time and it didn't stop him. He, he, he clearly said what he wanted, that Israel would be his companions. That he would, they would be the family that he had always wanted ever since Adam and Eve. And Israel's role as this nation of priests, who would they be priests for? It's for the other nations, to bring the other nations into this relationship with God too, to enjoy the fellowship. The people, you know, uh, disobeyed again and again, and, and God, you know, asked Moses, well, you know, how about I just get rid of them and start over with you? Well, God knew how Moses was going to respond to that. And, you know, Moses interceded, said, no, no, you know, you, you've made promises to them, you've got to keep them. God was helping Moses see his own role as an intermediary to, to intercede for the people, to be, to help connect them, to give mercy and forgiveness to them. Part of the role that he foreshadowed of what Jesus would do for all of us. What Moses did in a preliminary way it was fulfilled and done in a complete way by Jesus. And this, God had this face-to-face -face relationship with Moses, just as he had with Abraham, where the, Abraham had bargained with him over the fate of the city of Sodom. Moses could bargain with him, reason with him over the fate of the Israelites. This is back-and-forth relationship. It was not just a simply command and you must, you must do what I say. There's an interaction there. And we see that in a lot of the Psalms. Uh, that's another section of the Bible, but you know, the people who wrote the Psalms were not afraid of expressing their anxiety. Why are you waiting so long, Lord? You know, they had a real relationship there. It wasn't just a matter of slave to master. Uh, Exodus 33, 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face. As one speaks to a friend. And that's apparently God's desire for all of his people. That he could speak with us as a friend. In verse 12. Moses said to the Lord. You've been telling me lead these people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moses wanted somebody to go with him. Uh, you've said, I, I know you by name, and I, you have found favor with me. Verse 14, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses was asking, who will go with us? And God responded that his presence would. It doesn't directly say that God would go with him, but it seems to imply that something as good as God would go with him. Something representing God. Uh, some means by which God would be with them. And this, we see that pattern continue. Uh, in Leviticus verse 9, verse 23, or chapter 9, verse 23. Moses and Aaron went to the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Verse 24, fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and fat portions on the altar. And all the people saw it. They shouted. This time they didn't. They weren't afraid. They shouted for joy. Yeah, good. Uh, I, I have the updated NIV, and that's the old NIV, and I was wondering if they'd changed their minds. But, uh, <laughs> all right. They shouted for joy and fell face down. So that this, this was something that they were looking forward. Whatever the glory 
was, or the presence of the Lord was. It indicated that God was there in the midst of them. None of the other nations around there had a God like that. So the people were full of joy. Numbers chapter 7 and verse 89 and Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord. He heard the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubim above the atonement cover on the Ark of the Covenant. In this way, the Lord spoke to him. The voice was the voice of God. It's another indirect way of saying that God was there. See, these indirect ways of talking about God seem to be balancing two different ideas. If, if they simply said that God was inside the tent, inside the Ark of the Covenant, some people might think that they had God in a box, under their control. Uh, and, and that's all of God there was. Uh, the Israelites later had a superstition like that, and they carried the Ark of the Covenant into battle, thinking that that would assure them of victory. Uh, but God wasn't under the control. Uh, that kind of control. The, the writers of the Bible knew that God was bigger than that. That he created the heavens and the earth. And he was really bigger than the universe. But the writers also wanted to say that this incredibly big God was also present with his people. Living with them. Although he could be everywhere all at once, he also wanted to be present with them. In a certain place. With a certain people. So there, there, there was this intermediary concept. The, the glory or the presence or the voice or the angel of God that was in, in some sense God. But wasn't all that God was. And it pointed forward to Jesus. Who was also an intermediary. God in the flesh. The point here in Numbers is that God is present with his people. Numbers 12, verse 5. The Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood. Same word, you know, used for human beings. He stood at the entrance of the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. The Lord was there, but he was in an, uh, there in an unusual way, in a pillar of cloud. We can't stereotype the way that God works or he appears. Numbers 14, 14. Israel grumbles and rebels against God again. And God asks Moses, you know, why not get rid of these grumblers? Just start over with Moses. And Moses again acted as an intermediary for the people, as a person who prefigured Jesus. Uh, Jesus will eventually be that intermediary, but he'll do it in a far more effective way. Moses can provide only a limited picture of what the people need. And Jesus is the fulfillment of what Moses could only picture. And Moses tells God, he, he argues with him, says, uh, you know, well, if you do that, they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people. And that you, Lord, have been seen face to face that your cloud stays over them and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God is with his people. They are his covenant people, the, promised, the people he promised to be with. Now we see that, that some of the laws that God gave through Moses as well. Numbers 35 and verse 34. Do not defile the land where you live. And where I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell among the Israelites. He fills the earth and the heavens, and yet he also chooses to live with a specific place and people. In Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 through 7, and Moses tells the people, See, I, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you're entering to take possession of it. This was just before they went into the land of Canaan. And Moses tells them, Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about these decrees and say, Surely this nation is a wise and understanding people. What, verse 7, what other nation is so great as to have their gods near them? 
the way the Lord our God is near to us when we pray to him. So he was with the people in a way that the other gods were not. They worshipped Baal, and Baal lived off on Mount Zephon, way up north. Uh, they did all these sacrifices to him, but he lived way up north. And the Greek gods, they lived up on Mount Olympus. But God, the true God of the Israelites, was with his people. It shows a very different relationship that the God had with his people, that he wanted to be with them. He wanted them to mature and have a relationship with him. And the same is true today. In Deuteronomy 5, uh, verse 3, God, Moses is talking to the people uh, again. He says, It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant. Oh, you know, technically that was true. These were the children of those people that were at Mount Sinai. But Moses is saying, Look, it's with you too. Uh, all of us who are alive here today, that's what the covenant is for. That's what the promises are for. Verse 4, the Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. So the, you know, this face to face is a figure of speech. It's not actually talking about you know, eyes, nose, mouth, you know, that kind of face. But face to face is a figure of speech for a close relationship where you can have some interaction. It's not just a one-way relationship in which... I have to sacrifice animals and appease the God's anger. Uh, but there's a relationship in which I can pray and He will hear. He will answer. Deuteronomy 12, verse 5. Uh, Moses again giving instructions for what to do after they arrive at the land. But you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. Verse 6. There, bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes and special gifts, what you vowed to give, your free will offerings. Verse 7. In the presence of the Lord your God, you and your family shall eat and shall rejoice in everything you put your hand to because the Lord your God has blessed you. The picture is that God is there. He's with His people. He wants them to be with Him. The instructions He gives to them are not some arbitrary rules for what they have to do to avoid His anger. They are rules, guidelines for a relationship that He wants to be with them. And there's an interesting law in Deuteronomy 23. And he's talking, verse, starting in verse 12. He's talking about how the, as the Israelites go on their uh, campaigns and the armies, designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with. <laughs> when you relieve yourself, dig a hole. <laughs> Verse 14, why is this? Because the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you, to deliver your enemies to you. Your camp must be holy. Now the rule was there because God was there. Because God was with his people. That's what he wanted, to have the relationship with him. Now, Moses is quite aware that God lives in heaven, but he also lives in the tabernacle. Later he lived in the temple. And now he lives in the church. In his people. Not just us as a mass. But individually. He lives in us. At the same time. Being the God of so, so stupendously large. That he, heaven cannot contain him. He's also present with us. Each of us in a special way. When Moses was about to die, God had told him to you know, pass the leadership on to Joshua. And he told Moses what to tell Joshua. Deuteronomy 31, uh, verses, verses 6 through 8. Uh, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of the other people. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So then, verse 7, Moses did as he was told. He summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, 
For you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. Verse 8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be encouraged. Discouraged. Well, I hope, I hope some of that sounds familiar because it's quoted in the New Testament. It's one of those things that Marcion would have taken out. But the point is valid. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money. There's a message for the offertory. Be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. He took this promise given to Joshua and applied it to all the people of the church because he wants to be with his people. Verse 6, so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Human beings can't do much to us when God is on our side. Well, they, well, they can take our stuff, they can kill us. They do that. But they can't take our life away. Do not fear those who cannot take or can kill the body, but not the soul. Because God is with us. And that is his goal for us all along, that he will be with us. That's the name, the meaning of the name Emmanuel, which we often hear about Christmas, but we also sang in the song earlier this morning. Or afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Emmanuel. God with us. That was true in the Old Testament. It is true, more true in the New. And we look at uh, Hebrews 1, uh, verses 1 through 4. Uh, look at that again. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Verse 2. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by the Son, His Son. Far better than this scattered, uh, you know, bits and pieces here and there in the Old Testament, where God occasionally spoke to people, kind of hid himself in the tabernacle. He's not doing that anymore. And Jesus, he comes to us face to face, real face, at least in the days of Jesus. It was a real face that we saw, that the disciples saw. He spoke with them in ordinary language. He spoke to thousands that way. He had a relationship with them. And that has been his goal all along, and that is his goal for all of us into eternity, that we'll have this relationship. Verse 3, and it's not just an inferior being that we're dealing with here. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The same word that said, let there be light is also with us, wants to be with us, wants to interact with us. And after Jesus had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven and he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. We have a superior relationship with God through Jesus. But it's still, it's a fulfillment of something that he had already planned for us from the start. And we see that throughout the Old Testament. And that's one of the reasons we shouldn't throw the Old Testament away. It's because it helps us see the picture of what God has been doing in the past. And that what he's doing now in our lives has continuity all the way back to the creation of humanity. And all the way forward into the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, when God when the New Jerusalem will come down from heaven to earth and God will be with his people. So he desires that kind of relationship with each of us. It will be different for each one of us. Just as my relationship is different with different people. And all of us have limitations. God knows our limitations. He deals with us as we are able to bear it. But the point is... That he wants that relationship and we need to seek him. And sometimes the, uh, people talk about seeking God's face. It's not like we're trying to see eyes, nose, and mouth. But we're trying to see 
the personality there, the relationship that is there, the interaction that he wants to have, that we will know what he wants us to do, that we'll have the same kind of heart and mind that he has, that he wants us to be. Because the relationship that he has with us is to be a transforming relationship, that we are changed, uh, as Paul described it, changed from glory to glory, as we are becoming more and more like He is in this interaction, in this encounter with God, that we are becoming more like He is. That's right. Father, we thank You for this uh, relationship that You have always desired for us, that You've created us for that. Help us learn more about it. Help us draw close to You through Your Word whether it's scripture or through your word, Jesus Christ. Help us hunger for what you have to offer and give ourselves to you. We thank you in Jesus' name.